highly recommend joining our Discord channel because it's a great way to um, ask some of the more detailed and technical questions um, from our team. Um, nonetheless, uh, today's class, we've had a couple of requests for uh, how to do hair. And it's actually a can of worms going into hair. So what I'd like to do today is walk through a couple of the options and show exactly some of the pitfalls and problems of the various various uh, shading options that you've got available to you, the solutions, um, and the very latest versions of our hair shader, uh, which you can get off the um, off one of my GitHub's personal sites. You can just grab it from there. Um, I'll put a link in the chat later for um, grabbing those. Now, um, I actually just want to walk through a couple of things first uh, on hair and some of the, the common things. Now, I've just grabbed a hair from uh, one of our creators, Nusi, and unfortunately, I've just had Unity Crit tank itself. Um, that's okay, actually, because I can do it in here. We might just jump forward one step and I'll recreate some of those problems. Um, so this is actually one a different hair. This is one of the ones from our um, mod.io site where you can just download all our various templates. We've got a lot of them. Some of them are a little bit low poly and you can do some work on cleaning them up. Uh, but nonetheless, it's a good starting point for just grabbing something to, to get into and uh, quickly. So this is one of the hairs that's available on the site. It's just the men's, men's ponytail one. Now, immediately we're gonna run into some issues with shading. Um, and that is, as you can see here, as we rotate around that, we're actually seeing bits poke through that shouldn't poke through the, the object. Now the quickest and easiest solution for this problem um, is to make the object um, cut out. When you set it cut out, it's able to do accurate um, depth testing on the on the um, Z buffer. And that, actually, I don't know if we can actually see that in one of the visualizers. It would be nice if we could, but no, it doesn't look like we can. Um, however, as I said, one of the issues is that these things are gonna, gonna um, oscillate, well not oscillate, but draw in the wrong, wrong order. Um, and cut out fixes that by simply rendering it as a normal normal object instead of a transparent object and it just sort of clips off the areas that um, would be transparent. Uh, the problem with this approach is it's not very attractive. As you can see here that we just sort of end up with these sharp sharp lines, there's no no blur. Whereas if we go into the fade mode, um, it is a little bit uglier. Um, however, the object fades out correctly. Now if I just drop a male object into this scene just for the sake of it, let's drop our choice of in male. Uh, as you can see, this is already set up to fit the fit the avatar. We can sort of see a lot of these, these various problems. The second problem is that this hair has been designed to use two-sided shaders, and that means that it's got a, a double pass. Now, I've written a series of hair shaders uh, which solve this problem. If we go to my GitHub, uh, you'll find that it's the most popular project that I've made because it's... Um, been released on several times. So I actually have um, Adam's hair shader available here, which you can just download and install. And this adds anisotropic highlights. It does handle some, some better rendering. Um, oh, there is some pitfalls with this particular shader. Uh, one of them is that it can go black in certain scenes. It seems to be scenes without a directional light it uh, misbehaves in. Um, however, we have a sixth version of this shader, which I will be demonstrating today on how to, how to get this. Um, handled. So the, I'll just demo off the, the original version. Now the original version does have some advantages on the quality. Um, there's two things it does. The first is it um, has anisotropic, anisotropic highlights and for those who are not aware of what that actually means, so I'll just turn this, um, the directional lights back on in the scene. I'm just going to rotate the directional lights. So we've got that in front of the avatar. So the sunlight. This is just a blank, blank sign space scene straight off the template. Um, so I'm going to switch this to sine wave, hair, modern hair and this gives you some of the benefits of cutout as you can see immediately that it's got the correct uh, z order rendering um, and it also gives you the option for doing an isotopic highlights and as you can see here we can make this hair look like a uh, hair care commercial by giving these sort of uh, nice bands of the reflection whereas if we did this with a we'll just duplicate this i'll just create a copy Just wait for Unity to um, update from there. So this one I'm going to do with just the normal, normal standard shader. I'm going to set it to cut out just so we don't have the same uh, Z fighting problems. But I am going to leave the smoothness in place, and we can have a look at how this looks by comparison. Um, so this is normal specular highlights, as you can see there. 
versus anisotropic ones. And the anisotropic ones actually render closer to hair. And the reason for that is because hair is actually not one solid surface. It's a series of fibers. And each fiber has got its own specular highlights positioned sort of in sequence one after the other. And the, the rows of them in parallel produces the, the highlight effects that you see there. Um, the other thing I like to do is to add a little bit of metallic. It's not realistic to do this. Um, hair is not metallic. However, it does pick up scene reflections a little bit better. If I change the scene skybox, I don't know if I've got any skyboxes in here, but uh, let me see if I do. Try and pick one if I've got one. Sample cloud skybox. I don't know if that's going to give much of a, a nice appearance. Let me just add a couple of objects into the scene so we can put some reflections in, um, just so you can sort of see some of these why the metallic can produce nicer nicer results. So I'll just uh, paint these guys in a colour. Um, blue and I'll put a reflection probe just in the scene. So I'm just going to create another reflection probe uh, effects. Where is it? Light. There we go. So a reflection probe into the centre of the scene. Just around the head. Um, and I'll set that to real time. Might produce a little bit of lag doing that, but um, let's turn off the reflection probe. Uh, gizmo. And now the. Did I just turn you off? Uh, reflection probe. Yes, I did turn you off. I don't know why it's doing that, but whatever. Um, now you get a sort of, sort of juicier reflections on these. So we should be able to raise this up and see them in the in the metallics, especially as we raise these metallic values. We should be able to do this. Not quite sure why that isn't, but uh, it might be just my scenes that up. Um, all right, so this is the sort of the, some of the benefits of using this particular shader. Um, now, as I said, the, it does have some downsides. It does not work in certain regions, which is a problem. I have got a new version of this shader, which um, works a bit better overall. Um, again, if we raise the metallic on this one, maybe we'll see those highlights. No, we won't. Um, so what I'd like to do is show off how to use that one. Now, this shader uses a convenient trick of Unity. If you look at an object, you've got this materials array. Now the materials array comes from the actual mesh file itself. A mesh can have lots of materials attached to it. Uh, if you're used to 3D modeling, you'll know that you can add multiple materials to a single object. However, in Unity, if you've got more materials than there are mesh slots on the mesh, Unity will begin to repeat the, the meshes. It'll repeat the last mesh, uh, the last material um, assigned to the mesh, and it'll repeat that section of mesh over and over again with the additional materials you add. And this means we can actually layer layer materials together. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to duplicate this guy again. And I'm going to duplicate my material twice. Now this is going to be the sixth version of the shader. Now it has some, some upsides and downsides. The downside to it is that it doesn't yet support anisotropic highlights, which is a, a little bit of a problem. The other thing it doesn't support is that it uh, lacks, um, what is it? It's the rim highlights and translucency that we've added to the, the more powerful shader. Those I haven't gone into here. Um, but they do exist uh, in these settings. So actually we can go from, we can adjust the anisotropic highlight levels. So you can go from just normal to, to fully out. Um, you can adjust these at your, your leisure. The other thing we've got is we've got the ability to damp the Fresnel so it doesn't look so reflective when in, you've got highly reflective surfaces. Um, as you can see here, there's a lot of, lot of settings you can play with on how this one's. And the other one is that it's got is this translucent power um, which actually just lets us, I'll just have to find the right, right slate of, right set of slider combinations for this one. We might be on the wrong, wrong version of the shader. There's three versions that run in, in parallel. Uh, the other thing you'll notice is that it's got alpha cutoff uh, on this shader. So this shader, um, one of the things it does is it, it's a little bit sneaky and it, it renders twice. Uh, it renders first to work out the Z depth, that is sort of give it accurate positioning information, that way it layers correctly. And then the second time it renders um, over the top with the, the sort of faded transparency. And this way it gives you a best of both worlds scenario. Um, the only areas that it sort of runs into problems are right at the little edges um, of the fade. And that is usually an acceptable trade-off. It's not horribly obvious um, and it does give you just some of the benefits you could want on um, on this. And I'm just going to swap to maybe one of the other versions of this hair. Or is it hair? 
Is it four pack? No, that's for our version four. Oh no, this is the right one. Um, so here you can sort of play with this version, you can play with some of the, the built-in highlight powers and things like that, which give you more accurate, um, uh, sorry, not more accurate, but more control over over sort of how it, how it actually renders. Um, and you can play with this to your heart's content. Sorry. Um, that's the sort of some of the basics of that particular hair shader. Now I'm going to skip to the next one because as I said, this one solves a lot of these problems um, and it does this by using these repeated materials. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to create a second material slot here. We're going to drag two and three. Now these are going to both run two different shaders, but we want kind of similar settings on both. Uh, so this will show up as hair, uh, or it should. Where did I put it? I might not have imported the shader. Um, did I not import the shader? Oh, I have not imported the shader. Ah, there we go. I will just put this one in this project somewhere. So this is available in my GitHub. Um, and this folder was actually going to give away some of the, the stuff we're going to be doing in a minute. Um, so I'm just going to set this one to hair shaders, import these, import into Unity and wait a minute because it does take a second to import these shaders. These ones are much simpler, um, they shouldn't take too long to, to calculate. Uh, and you'll notice that there's, there's two, sh well actually there's a whole suite of these but you won't need to worry about 6A and 6B. Um, so I'm just going to go to this one and I should be able to set this now to hair slash 6, six part A. And we've got six part B. I can talk a little bit about how this actually works in a second. So six part A and six part B are designed to be used together. Um, you can adjust certain bits and pieces. Um, the alpha cutout threshold between the two should be very close together. Um, and I think this one might be picking up the, some of the ambient. Um, We don't have nice baked lighting in this particular um, region that we're working on, so some of these lightings might be a little bit uh, dimmer than we want. I'm just going to set that up to something a little bit not more normal. Um, so this one solves the problem in a different way, and I'm going to show exactly some of these other problems that show up with the, the various hair. So this 6A and 6B I do recommend using. Uh, to use it, you just need to duplicate the material twice and use both 6A and 6B. Now. This one over here, um, this one does the uh, underlying Z pass and the the follow up Z pass at the same time. And in order for that to work, we have to run the rendering quite late in the in the sort of the rendering pipeline. Uh, you don't need to worry about any of this stuff. This is is sort of beyond the the scope of anything you need to really worry about. But one of the downsides to it is what we will show off in just a moment, and that is I'm going to create a camera. Going to set that to here, the post layer, and this is going to emulate some of the problems we're about to about to see. I'm going to add a post uh, post volume, market global. I'm just going to set, create this new new volume. I'm going to enable depth of field, and if you've used the snapshot tool with some hairs, you'll notice that the depth of field gets a little bit screwy, especially as you do high higher more intense depth of field. Um, that the hair gets worse and worse because the hair gets sort of gets part of the background. And that's due to the fact that we run this quite late in the process. It doesn't have time to actually influence the, the post stack um, perception of the depth that actually it really should be. So I'm just going to enable this one. Um, I'm going to set this. Now in theory, I think this should... Just one sec. Why aren't you? Oh, right. I need to set the layer. I'm going to complain about that. There we go. Okay. So now we've got uh, aperture and focal length. So I should be able to scroll this one. Whoops. Scroll this one through. And I'm going to duplicate my person. I'm also going to put a texture on him so he's actually. Male. Right, just gonna duplicate him a couple of times. Now, as we move this camera back, I'm gonna play with this 
aperture so we get a more convenient, more correct effect. So on the left first one, as you can see here, we've got no blur around the edge here, but we do have it on the character and that looks odd. Um, on the cutout one, we've got correct and accurate uh, depth, so it doesn't have any problems, but we don't have the nice fade. This third one, you'll notice, actually does have the correct depth on the hair. So the hair is blurring as it should. And I'll just widen that up. So as we manipulate this, this one looks correct, however this one doesn't. Um, so this shader is a pretty basic one. It does also support double-sided cutout. You'll notice that none of the other ones do. Oh, actually, sorry, this one does as well. The hair shader does, but the default cutout shaders do not. This one is accurate cutout, so it will actually handle lighting correctly. If I place a light here. Um, <coughs> sorry. This one um, should, generally speaking, behave. You'll also notice the light's quite diffused on this, um, this hair shader rather than producing big specular highlights, and that's a little bit more accurate. Um, overall, we do need to get the, anis the anisotropic highlights back and I, it is possible to do this. You'll just need to combine the two shaders that I've built in order to, in order to do that. Um, that is an exercise for the reader at the moment. However, at some point I will actually get a chance to do it myself uh, and we'll bundle up into the edit packs. So that's the first thing um, with hair shading. It's sort of some of the overviews and I know that this is probably a little bit more complicated than, than we'd hoped, um, but I think we can cover off a few things. We've got first, we've got the modern hair shader, which is available on the GitHub. You can grab that one, that's the older one. It does have some nice pretty effects. However, it does also have some drawbacks. We've got the new modern one. And uh, part of the problem with showing off this hair is that the texture on it is actually pretty ugly. Um, the new modern one does, V6 does require using two material slots. However, it's more accurate and will have less sort of issues. It will render overall better. Um, and as soon as we add the anisotropic highlights, there'll be no reason to use the old one. <clears throat> um, the final thing that I wanted to touch on, and that was actually using um, cloth physics. Now, cloth physics in hair has not really been used very much, um, but it is something that I think does lend some benefits. So I'd like to go over a little bit of a super quick tutorial on how to do cloth. Um, there is a whole sort of manual that you want to go into if you really want to dig into cloth physics in a deep and deep and complex way. But today we're not going to bother. Um, today we're just going to do the very bare minimum we do need to in order for cloth physics to work. So I'm just going to add a uh, clothing item settings. I'm just going to convert this to a um, rigged bit of clothing. To do that, I just need to go into the skin section. There's an automatic skin weighting button. You have to dig down a little bit in the market for these buttons, but we'll just do that. <coughs> and I have... Got this one weighted now. I've just done something very stupid, but oh well. Um, that's fine. I'm going to take the original black point, those ponytails, I'm just going to take those off. And now we've got this, which is our, our weighted, weighted bit of clothing. Um, now, for this to uh, work with clothing, we do need to rig it first, like we have. We need to add a cloth component. This is a Unity built-in component. Uh, we also need to adjust the um, adjust the bounds. Uh, if you notice that something's disappearing like this after we've had problems, I've noticed that this happens particularly when you actually add add cloth bound, uh, add cloth. Sometimes it screws up the bound of the mesh, so we can just use one of the tools to um, fix that. And it's just somewhere around here. Recalculate bounds. Okay, that's gonna misbehave probably because I misaligned it to begin with. Okay, um, we're just gonna have to run with this one, I'm afraid. All right, so I'm just gonna take the cloth and I'm gonna start editing the constraints. And you'll see here that this is the cloth. Um, areas that are black or gray like they are right now are set not to move. Now we're gonna paint some, paint some basics. Now the editor in 2017.4 and sorry, 0.3 and onwards is a little bit better to use. I'm still on 2017.2 right now because I'm doing some editor pack work and I have to use old versions of Unity for that now. Uh, what we can do is we can set the max distance. Now this is actually measured in meters, I believe. Um, so you wanna be very be very careful with it. Hair is not typically flying off 20 centimeters around the place. Um, so this default value of 0.2 is going to be too high. 
Uh, instead, we hit, want the hair to move no more than about an inch, and that's about two centimeters. We'll just add a zero in front of that one. We can just start painting some bits and pieces. Now, I'm probably going to need to do this correctly because I misaligned the meshes to begin with, but what we can do is we can just paint down some of these vertices, um, and these ones will now shake around as the avatar moves. Um, what you want to try and do is aim when doing hair in particular is not bother with the top of the hair so much because that can look very odd but just look for the the bottom points on the hair and just start sort of manipulating these uh, bangs and so forth and they'll just flop flop around on their own quite nicely and they won't ever move more than about two centimeters which is good when you're animating um one of my co-workers Digvido, actually has some really fantastic cloth hair which i would have loved to show it off today but unfortunately i forgot to ask before he left um for the office no, sorry, before the close of the office. Um, anyway, um, so we'll just keep doing here. And effectively, once you've done this process, your cloth is good to go. Now, um, aha, there's our, our issue. The boundary the bounds of this model is, is internally a little bit off. Uh, I believe that's something that um, the cloth will do. The second thing you want to play with, particularly if you're working with... Um, so I'll just bring back one of my male avatars, my choice for male. So I know we've got this guy a little bit screwy, but um, the second thing you want to consider with longer hair, with short hair, you don't need to worry about this, but for longer hair, one of the things you can play with is um, the cloth colliders. Now cloth colliders actually allow you to create um, a basically an area that the hair will never enter. Now this is useful if you've got long hair and you don't want it to pass through the avatar itself not particularly appealing when you do that uh, to do that you just need to start creating uh, capsules now you need to do this on the actual avatar itself so you need to place an avatar in the scene at zero 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 but when you do this and you need to navigate down the reference category and you want to find the various bones that you're going to be using and then you pick a pick a bone like for instance this chest um, we'll add a sphere collider now i'm going to size it and position it uh, you can then use the, for instance, the offsets to move things around, but we don't want the hair to ever enter this sphere. Uh, you can only ever use capsules and spheres when you're doing this, by the way. Um, so just be careful of that, and you can have no more than 16 attached to a particular um, item. So now I've got that one. I can then drag that into the cloth section. I can see the sphere colliders. I attach it to the chest. I'll just drag it into the... I think it was chest. Was it chest? Yes. Um, so I'll just add one sphere collider and sphere colliders is particularly special with uh, cloth because you can actually create cap uh, not capsules but a kind of like volume zone uh, and to do that I could do something like for instance the uh, spine we'll create add another sphere collider here and this one's gonna be much larger like that and when we do this on the, the cloth item we can add this as a secondary uh, sphere collider there and when it does that it'll actually create a sort of conical structure between the two as you can see it's a bit hard to see it's the white let me just uh make this a bit darker and we can look at this you can see this weird conical structure um that just is a quick way of creating more complicated um prevention areas and it's still very fast to do the actual calculations on that uh, so you can sort of adjust and tweak and, and manipulate you might want to consider for instance in this case you actually run one from the elbow to the elbow uh, shoulder to the shoulder uh, and use that as your your structure that might be a good good point for hair um, but again this is up to you uh, just remember to factor in the fact that clothes are going to be worn on the top of this so doing this exactly skin tight against the base avatar may not be the best solution you may want to factor in a little couple of centimeters just out of it to allow for jackets and things to um, to be worn that the cloth won't enter when you've added those colliders in um, when you actually do the prepare step which i'm not going to do now because it will will tank up my editor for a minute uh, you'll see there'll be a little section in there saying cloth providers uh cloth colliders stored and it'll give you some some stats on that uh, that's just to check that the data is copied correctly other than that that hair is now sort of good to go and upload um other than the fact that i had that positioned wrong when i, I scaled it and unfortunately that's gonna be a little bit of a pain to fix um okay so we have um that's some of the basics of how to make nice looking hair. The next thing I wanted to cover today was actually a new feature. Uh, and this is something that's new in Editor Pack 14. Uh, it's new in our 2019.1 viewers. Even the release viewer has support for this. However, there is a lot of patches to it that are coming in the next viewer along with many, 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 many other things. Uh, and that is the ability to create 
uh, much more fully featured avatar morphs and customizations yourself. Now, if you load into Science Base, you know that we've got a hundred and something uh, various body sliders and face sliders and things like that. The problem with these has been twofold. The first is that uh, we've never been able to make enough of them. Every time we add one, there's a request for three more. And that means that uh, we're perpetually adding new sliders to the, the platform. And the second thing is that um, as we add more and more of these base base um, morphs, they're actually adding a lot to the file size of the client. So it doesn't matter so much for people on the desktop users, but if you're using WebGL or the upcoming mobile clients, um, then adding 30 or 40 megabytes worth of, of morph slider data is too much. Um, so what we have done is we've added the ability to, for you to create clothing items that contain morphs in them. And I'm gonna show you the basics of how to do that today. Um, so what we're gonna do is we can start with one of our base avatars and I'm just gonna trash this scene. I'm not gonna save this one today. And I'm gonna remember that for the next time. Uh, I'm gonna start with a 2017 male and we can actually make a morph for the male. So you need to do this with the highest resolution models uh, because they will be automatically scaled down to the low ones. You only need to do this once. You don't need to do it for every one of our LOD models. Uh, and the way we grab the mail. So I'm just going to import these FBXs in into Blender. Now you can do this in any 3D modeling package you want. The, the route we've done, uh, we started out allowing this in ZBrush. Um, you can use ZBrush's uh, vertex displacement map feature in order to create these morphs too. It uses the same file format, um, but we have written a quick tool for Blender to be able to do these directly in there. Um, so I'm going to uh, try and remember my Blender ca my camera controls. Uh, there we go. Right, so I have my male meshes here. Now, the very first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to export this one straight away. And we are going to export it into a directory in here called body morph tests, which is I've prepared just ahead of this class starting. Um, and I think all those settings are correct. Is it, no, it's Z forward for you. Oh, no, it's minus Z forward. I'm trying to remember that there's a few bits and pieces in here that you sort of have to, to watch for um, when exporting these uh, models from Blender. I'm just gonna do a quick test morph with no no changes. Now, I highly recommend doing this, just creating a no changes model and just immediately export it because uh, various 3D packages have all sorts of weird internal rotations and, and repositioning on actual underlying vertex coordinates. It's very frustrating to deal with, but uh, it's even more frustrating if you're doing one of these morphs and it's all going crazy because your 3D package is doing something weird. Blender is one of these 3D packages that's doing something weird. Uh, several others are as well. Um, 3ds Max has an internal rotation of sort of minus 90 degrees on, on certain certain coordinates, um, which is always a little bit annoying to, to handle. So I do recommend just doing a, a basic export as is, no changes to the model. Uh, and that we are able to use in the tool we're about to use um, that will uh, export. I'm taking a while to export. Um, Yes, so this base one will just provide a reference model. Uh, this also means you can subdivide the model. So if you're going to be subdividing the model before you make changes, that's perfectly acceptable. Um, you can do that. Just make sure to save a no change variant that's subdivided before you start making changes to the model uh, to create your morph. Um, because if you create your morph afterwards, you will not be able to use it. Um, you've got to be able to have the same number of vertices in the same positions and the same orderings in your reference model um, than you do in your final one. So we'll just wait a minute. And has Blender frozen? It's not Unity today. Maybe. So I've actually written a file. Got enough tests. It has not written a file. Uh, this is take two. Right, uh, we'll work from templates. I'll try the female this time. Come on. Maybe Blender does not like me today.
particularly funny going on. I swear. Nice if I could go through one of these without some program misbehaving on me. All right, let's try, try again. I'm just gonna go with the low res one um, just for the sake of, of testing. Um, you can, however, use the high one and I do recommend using the high one, but maybe the low one's gonna be a little bit better because it's just a small model. Okay, all right, so I've got my, my mail here, a couple of, couple of shapes, I'm gonna export him. FBX and body morph tests. I'm just gonna call this no mod 2015 mail. Incidentally, we don't have to use FBX for this. In fact, if I keep having problems with the FBX exporter, I might switch to another format. Um, well, Blender's doing something. Don't know what Blender's doing, but uh, it's doing something. Uh, I'll give it just a second, and then if it's misbehaving again, we'll switch to another file format and see if it behaves again. One oh, art. Right. So now this one opens. Don't know why it's misbehaving on export, but uh, whatever. I might just try strip the armature off and see if it's uh, see if it's that. Um, okay. We'll just do an export. Select it only. I'll export as a DAE this time. Doesn't really matter uh, what we export in. So we'll just call this one. No morphs. Twenty fifteen. Twenty fifteen mail. Just make sure it exports into um, into Unity correctly just before we start any serious work. All right, so we've exported. Just go into Unity. Make sure Unity can see the file correctly um, because it would suck if we did all this work and then uh, got stuck stuck here. Okay, so we've got no morphs. Yep. Okay. Um, we do have a unwanted rotation here. And this is exactly the sort of issue that we, we want to try and avoid. Um, so I might just see if I can export this one one more time as an FBX. Uh, if we can't, we can't. So, um, let's try this one more time. It's definitely doing something. Um, failing this, we can we can work with this. Uh, we'll just need to probably play with the, some of the settings on the tool we're about to use, uh, which should deal with a few of these issues. There's definitely something up with the uh, Blender's FBX exporter today. That is so weird. I've been using this for weeks. Oh well. Um, actually, that's not true. I upgraded recently. That's probably the cause of it. Okay. So we're just gonna go in here. We've done a straight export, so we know the know this data's there. We know it's coming through. Okay. Um, and I'm just gonna close, delete this guy out. Um, there is gonna be steps we're gonna need to take with this, but. Oh, uh, for the moment, we've got this. Okay, so we're gonna start making some changes to this morph. So let's say, I don't know, let's uh, let's make some serious, seriously weird changes to this avatar. Uh, I'm gonna grab, let's grab edges. Okay, we've got something here. Almost looks like a smiley face. Why don't we run with this? I'm going to scale these. Now, this is not a particularly attractive morph. This is just simply me, me messing around with the um, 
the morphing system. And I do recommend, just as a, as a matter of course, uh, that you basically, uh, sorry, you use the high resolution model because you'll get a more accurate, accurate fit. Uh, I'll just try and get some of these guys. Okay, so I've got that. Now you cannot add or, or delete vertices um, in this particular way. If you're gonna do that, make sure to modify the, the or subdivide before you start editing, just so you've got the originals matching up uh, because the tool does rely on the vertex, vertex count not being changed. Uh, if you change the vertex count, it's all, all bets are off. Okay, so we've got a something here. Uh, I did delete the armature last time, I think. Just double check that one. I don't think it matters too much. Um, right, so I'm just going to export this guy as a DAE. And this is going to be our with mod. So, morph 2015 male DAE. That's all correct. And uh, DAE produces wonderful 300 megabyte files for tiny little meshes. Uh, it's the benefits of a text based. 3D mesh format that uses XML. So it blocks things out in ways that uh, it really shouldn't. Okay, so I've got that one and I should. There okay, we go. So we get our weird morphed character. If I drop him in here and set this to minus 90. 90. We'll see that uh, this guy has wonderful appearance, but overall we've got a pretty distinctive weird morph on this this character so to create this into a morph map which can be uploaded in the clothing item settings i'm going to first uh i'm going to use the sign space then tools then there's a create body morph texture now this can be used by anyone to create a uh, morph so we're going to call this weird morph now asks a folder put in just because it comes sometimes can output multiple files depending on what you're doing um, if there's more than one material on the object, then it will output more than one material. Uh, so to do this, we need to drop in the no morphed version. We drop this one into the top setting, which is the original template. And then in here, into the modified template, we attach that. And now the scale is probably completely screwed up. So I'm gonna, even now I think the scale is, is weird, but I guess I'll use the file scale. I'm pretty sure I've got these settings tuned in for Blender, uh, the default ones. Now, this uh, tool is a little bit um, little bit complicated, but what it effectively does is it creates a uh, it creates a body morph that um, basically is a texture that represents how the how the avatar's been morphed. Uh, and I think that we've got all these various settings correct. Uh, the only thing to watch out for is the resolution. Um, these particular textures can be huge. Uh, it is perfectly acceptable for them to be huge. Uh, they compress extremely well. Um, a 48 meg or more texture that can be outputted if it's 4096 will compress after um, some magic's been done to it down to a couple of kilobytes. We're usually talking like 5 to 20 kilobytes. It's not a, not a huge uh, huge change. However, um, rendering at higher resolutions than 2048 can push your graphics card. If you've got a machine with a graphics card that does not have a lot of memory, um, you can crash Unity, as I've discovered, by setting it to 4096 or 8K or higher. Um, I generally recommend using at least 2048. If you can do 4096, do it, uh, because there is some benefits um, in the output quality. Last thing we're going to do is just going to click uh, Show Preview. And I am going to hide hide all this and hit bake map and immediately I've got a small issue here um, which is probably indicating that the two meshes have a different uh, vertex count for some reason I'm just going to drop this into my other project if I can hoping to avoid that today um, So it's running on my master project um, that I know does work with this. So I'll just double check it in there first. Well, I think the other thing I need to do is mark it readable. Read write is enabled, great. 
Okay. Um, so uh, th once we've done this process and um, I have been trialing with a, a few things, um, the next step is you create an empty virtual good and I'll just wait for this other Unity project to load. But while I do, copy on settings, um, you can see there's this uh, body slider map. And this one's just the texture you line up here. Uh, one thing to note, uh, well, there's two things to note here. Um, first is that one, do re follow this um, information carefully. This tool will output um, the file, which is an EX EXR file. An EXR file is kind of like an HDR texture. It contains information um, that goes beyond the sort of zero to 255 range of a bitmap. It can run into negative numbers and it can run into positive numbers, which is actually what we use uh, as part of this process. The second thing it does is um, it will, uh, sorry, next thing to, to worry about is it's gonna be marked readable. That means when you select the, the texture in Unity, you've got to click this read, write enabled tick box. Um, that means that Unity can actually read the data that's attached to it. And then finally, um, the last thing we've got here that's of important is the layout. Now you notice here we've got UV set UV1 and UV2. Um, I'm still waiting for, for Unity to kick back up on that other project, but um, if we have a look at this one and pull up our UVs, you'll notice that there is two UVs attached to the, the avatar. We get our base UVs. This set of UVs gives quite a bit of concentration on, on textual density to the face. Um, it doesn't give a lot to the to the hands and body. We basically prioritize areas that we think cameras are gonna focus on, and those areas have got higher, higher UV density. However, we've also got a second UV channel. And this one is based on actual overall size. And this one has an even texel, dex, texel density across the whole character. Um, when you output this model, you can actually pick which UV set to use. If you're working, for instance, on a morph that is entirely on the face, then it might be better to use the UV1. Um, if you're working on a whole body morph like this one, then it's probably better to use UV2. Uh, it's entirely up to you. The only thing that matters is that when you output this, you output that one too. Likewise, if you're using something like ZBrush to create these textures, then the... <clears throat> Then the trick to get going there um, is that you need to use the same UV layout when you actually bake the vertex displacement map. Um, again, pretty simple. And the last one is scale. And scale could just be used to fine tune the, the actual overall scale. Um, sometimes you might find that a morph is too extreme at its most heavy level, or it's not extreme enough. In this case, you can just multiply it. It's just a simple multiplier. If you set it to one, then that's 100%. If you set it to two, that's 200% effect and so on and so forth. Um, so you can use that just to scale up and down what it does. Uh, you could also invert the, the morph. I don't actually ever have tried that, but uh, it does does take negative numbers. So you could create an inverted version of the morph as well. Might be an easy way to create two, two morphs out of one, one project. <coughs> right, sorry. Um, Ah, hold on. I think I know what the issue is. There. Do we not have... We've got vertex colors there. Do we not have vertex... No, we do have that there. Okay. Bit odd, but uh, this might be a little bit to do with the file format. When I was doing these tests earlier, I was using FBX, and I think that's made a difference. Um, Come on, Unity. Uh, this is often a, a frequent frequent issue for me. <laughs> Unity Editor does start our big project very, very, very slowly. To... I wasn't anticipating using it today. Um, that's okay. Might even get some see some previews of uh, some upcoming features um, in that one. Uh, so we'll just sit and sit and twiddle our thumbs while this while this goes ahead. Um, so overall, one of the, the big benefits to be able to do this, um, if you look through our Discord channel, uh, a user called Ro Gastel has been doing some, some new faces, which I think is pretty cool. Uh, that's an overall good use of this, this particular feature. Um, one of the problems we do have is that we don't quite have enough facial sliders to be able to capture and adjust for sort of more realistic proportions. So you are free to add and insert additional things here. The other thing that I'll just note while we're, while we're waiting, that'll do. Right, uh, I'm just gonna. Come on. Just uh, ticking along. Uh, this, as I said, this project is particularly slow. It's not one I'd like to like to use my demos because it does have a lot of stuff in it. Um, I should work on 
redoing parts of the UI at the moment, so you might see some bits and pieces of that as we go. One minute. This is incidentally why I have Unity bound not to refresh files um, whenever I, I make a change there because uh, it's a little bit too much at the time. So I'm just going to create a temporary folder here and delete this later. <coughs> so we've got our body morph tests. I'm just going to take our two DAE files into here. Just going to create a new folder. Tools, crossbow, textures. Uh, right, we're going to output. And we've got that set there, 2048 mesh, I think. Oh, I'm going to refresh. Just let it import those two DAE files we made. And I think all of our settings are correct, but as I said, because we've got this 90 degree rotation on the avatars, we might have some problems there that we might need to correct. Uh, and that is what this tick box convert Y and Z is for. <clears throat> the rotation sideways is because various 3D packages use different coordinate systems. In fact, no two 3D packages seem to use the same same systems. Everyone's managed to reverse either Z or Y. Um, and there's many combinations of the two. Um, okay, so I've got our original no morphs. No morphs goes into the original slot, and our modified one goes into here. So show preview, I think. Okay, so there is a problem with this one. I might even just have a quick look at the code just because I've got it open and figure out what's actually wrong with this particular. So it's the original templates, vertices count is out of range, which means that the vertex count between these two models is not the same. In fact, that's 4850, and that one's 4... Yep, so there we are. Uh, so that was the problem we had with this one. So I can actually flip back to this project. And I just need to manage to export this without, without our various uh, problems. So which one? You've exported a 4850. Let me just double check the, the mail. And this is, in fact, the fun of file formats. So I'm just going to export this in two different ways. Um, I'm going to export him again as um, a DA, uh, not a DA, an OBJ. A little bit ugly, but um, call this one modified, <coughs> modified male uh, OBJ. <coughs> okay, I'm going to clear him out. Input one of our templates, the 2015 mail again, and import that across. And I will add a better error message for the two, but that is what you need to watch for. Uh, if you do see the vertices, uh, vertex counts change, then that's a sign that the tool won't be able to do its job. Um, so I just, I think I deleted the modifier in this one. Export OPJ, original mail. Hopefully. So I'm just gonna double check this original mail OBJ. You've got 4540. And you got 4540. And as you can see here, well, there's a little bit of a shift forward, but I think that's just because Unity's trying to center the thing, but otherwise that looks correct. Okay, take two. And I'll just drop this one in here. Yep, that's also got the correct rotations and the scales look correct too. Uh, so this one I think I've got a higher confidence in using. So just as a note, avoid DAE. Apparently we want to use um, OBJ if FBX is misbehaving. Okay, so show preview, bake map. Give it a second. Now this will take a little while to run and that's because it's it's generating a bunch of complex textures and it's having to re-import them a couple of times into Unity in various, various settings. But you'll see here immediately we've got the underscore zero EXR and if you tick this show preview box it'll actually show you just a, a preview as it runs through inside of our client um, so you can get an exact one-to-one 
reproduction, I think. Now, I just double check this. Uh, you'll notice that there is a blend shape on here. Now you just need to set this blend shape to 100. And this is implying one of our scales is off. Oops. So there's something a little bit wrong. Um, it should be a much more obvious, it should actually work. So this means we might need to tweak some of these settings. So we're gonna try and that it with a 1.0 scale. And just do it again. And you will wanna, we wanna flip around with these settings. Uh, if you get tired of that little pop-up asking about overriding overriding textures, you can just tick that little tech box overwrite silently. Um, often you will play around with these things a couple of times just to get the things right. Once you know what the settings are, that should be the case for every model you export from that 3D package. Uh, these ones I have built, um, the defaults have been for FBX um, with outputted from Blender, because I know that's one of the more common, common situations. And we'll just uh, pin down to him and we just look at our, here we go. Okay, so it looks like we've got the morph in. Uh, I can't quite tell if I've put the morph on the back instead of the front. Let me just uh, light the scene up a bit more. Yes, so I think I've got, got my coordinates a little bit screwy. Uh, it does look, actually look like though we have got this correct. I know it looks a bit odd from there and doesn't immediately look correct, but I think it actually might be. We'll just drop this into a default diffuse, like that one. Or our morph has been applied to the back instead of the front. I mean, the shoulders look correct, but this part does not. We'll just um, pull in our modified male. No, that might be correct. Now there's some discrepancy here. In this case, I think it's just due to the fact that this was built with the 2015. If you're gonna do this, use the 20, 2017. Um, because some changes between the various objects. No, that does actually look look correct. Okay, so this is our, our morph map. Um, I think that is correct, but for more accurate precision, use the use the um, the original high resolution model when doing these these edits. So we should have this one. It was came out as one called default zero. Uh, it uses the name of the mesh that you've inputted as the output. Uh, and if you look at this really really carefully, and I don't know how well this is going to show up in the stream. But you can see here that the uh, there's some colors attached to it. This actually shows where the thing is morphing. In fact, what I'm going to do is I'm going to increase the scale just so we can get a better clip view of this. So I might set this to five times scale. Uh, this is going to create a really weird looking uh, looking morph. But um, I'll just overwrite that one. Now, this one is our, our new test one. It's using a, using the new morph. And I'm just gonna go into here and you just need to go to the blend shapes. You'll see an ridge which shouldn't ever move. If it does, then there's something wrong. Um, but this one, yes, now we've got a multiple copies of the morph and the more extreme it is, it kind of gets all weird. Uh, you don't ever use the incorrect scale. Uh, but if we do look at this one, you can actually sort of see on the texture where the morph is happening. As you can see, these are all the, the vertices that we've moved and it's by how much we've moved them around um, in sort of X, Y, and Z on the various various uh, colors. Um, so that's sort of the basics of morphs. I'm just gonna set the scale back to one. I'm just gonna quickly bake it and then we'll actually upload this one as a, as a test. Uh, we probably won't have time today to actually see the outputs, but um, the preview viewers that should be coming up very shortly, um, you can use for testing this feature. The existing live viewers do work, but there are some bugs with this feature. Um, the biggest bug is that, uh, as you can see, separation on the skin surface. Uh, it's not particularly attractive, um, but uh, it does otherwise behave. Uh, and the cool thing is that, as with our existing built-in morphs, <clears throat> it works with all clothing um, pretty natively. And this means that we can sort of start making more interesting variations on humanoids. For instance, if you want to do an orc or something else that still works with the clothing system, uh, this is a, a great way of doing it. Uh, so we've got our, our test one there, got our default material there, we've got our game object that has our morph, so we're just going to set this one, this was built to the UV zero. Um, 
it's all good to go. Scale is one. Now this scale is basically like a, adjusting this scale on a on an after the fact basis. Um, you can use it just for fine tuning. Uh, all right, so this one mostly good to go. Virtual good. It just needs to be uploaded as a clothing item. So just click fix now. Um, I am currently uploading these into the skins category. I would suggest that we make a new one for morphs. Um, so we might do that at some point soon. So I've just uploaded the skin in general. Call this morph morph body test. Testing a morph. Uh, incidentally, you will notice there's a couple of new things popping into here. For instance, this one is a unique status uh, that'll give you some marketplace boosts if you if you set that one. Um, and otherwise, okay, so we've got got this guy, we're all good to go. I'm just gonna upload this. Uh, Might even set this one live as a test. Um, I'll have to put some icons and things on it, but uh, it would be cool to actually show that, I'll just show this one off um, afterwards. <clears throat> okay. And we should be good to go. I'm just gonna package down the EXR. And I think I've done something. The tool we built should actually set the EXR settings correctly, but I might have just made a mistake on this one. I, yes, it does actually set that is readable. Um, it will set the appropriate compression values. You'll notice that this is currently 22. We can actually crunch this. Um, so that is something to consider. Uh, I also sometimes consider just using no compression. It does have some some benefits. Um, nonetheless, uh, that should be should be a good uh, sort of starting introduction to creating morphs. And I do actually really look forward to seeing what you guys create. Uh, I think that there's a, a great deal of potential in this system for creating better default avatars. Because to be honest, some of our default avatars do have some some weaknesses, particularly around the face and ears and so forth, that you can really sort of begin to fine tune here. And of course, the other end is the more exciting exciting avatars that you can build so if you want to build sort of fantasy characters and, and so forth like goblins and whatever else um, then this can be a way of sort of morphing the default avatar to fit what you actually want um, probably just a final couple of notes before i, I close off um, don't try and morph uh, joints in, out of their position so for instance if i go back into my well gone now but um, if i look at this one um, if i for instance tried to morph something like shifting the elbow back or forward, this will not work because when the avatar is animated, uh, you'll find that weird bends suddenly appear instead of the, the smooth point. So my advice is to leave and limit the amount of morphing you do around bone joints uh, because you will get problems if you do that. Certain areas are really safe to morph, like for instance, the chest has got only a couple of bones in it, um, so it's pretty pretty safe to, to edit. Um, Really, the big ones you've got to worry about are the knees and the elbows. Um, as long as you leave those mostly okay, you can make them bigger, you can make them smaller, you can do those kinds of changes, but you can't shift the actual joint position out, out of the way. Um, you will get weird results. Uh, but hopefully that's a, a good good sort of starting coverage for this one, and I hope also the hair information is useful. If you do have particular suggestions for upcoming masterclasses, um, please poke myself or Dig4J. Dig4J is putting together a requests list um, for masterclass topics um, and we're going to be reviewing those uh, next week for the and laying out a, a whole series of what we're going to be covering um, going forward but hopefully a good starting point and I look forward to doing the next one see you